This is the last lesson now this trimester, and so we trust it'll be a good one. Uh, our textbook, Healing the Sick, the living classic. We're going to try to work uh, on chapters 17, uh, chapter 21, and chapter 23 of Healing the Sick today and pack them all together. And uh, I thought it'd be nice if we just call all of that. Uh, don't squawk loud, but talk proud. <laughs> I think uh, uh, that that would that would uh, synopsize the idea that we're dealing with today. This is a course <clears throat> on the ministry of healing, and since it's uh, the, we're dealing with the ministry of healing, we're dealing with the power of God's Word to heal us, to bring healing to us and to bring healing to the nations, to bring healing to, our, uh, to marriages that are in problem, healing to uh, uh, physical bodies that are sick <clears throat> or ill, to bring healing to our spirits. Uh, when we talk about the ministry of healing, as we've said before, we're talking about the God's interest in us being 100%. Psalms 103, verse 20, God said, <clears throat> or the Bible says, that God sent his word and healed them. Now, that does not just mean physical healing, but thank God it does mean physical healing. And in that case, it did refer to physical healing because he was talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, John 6, 63 says, Jesus speaking, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, look at John 14, verse 10. The words, W-O-R-D-S, that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works, W-O-R-K-S. So I circled the word words and the word works and drew a line and connected them because that introduces the idea of God's word and results. Isaiah chapter 55 sums up that idea beautifully. Listen to it. So, 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 underline that, S-O. In this way shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, <clears throat> but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. The question, how does it do that? Well, verse 10 answers it in Isaiah 55. As the rain and snow waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, that's the way it works. So shall my word be that goes out of my lips. Now, that scripture brings up the greatest principle I think that we have in the Bible concerning the Word of God. It is the principle of God's Word in us, or we might call it the principle of the kingdom. <clears throat> we are in the kingdom. The kingdom is in us. Kingdom really means reign or realm of God. Uh, you see, I, tell, I say, wherever Jesus Christ and me are together, God's kingdom is there because he in me reigns and rules. When I get there, the kingdom of God gets there. When you get there, the kingdom of God gets there. Uh, in this next semester, we're going to be dealing a lot with these ideas of discovering who we are and what we have and what we can do and what we're made out of. And then the problem of faith is solved. 
you'll never have to worry or concern yourself about having faith if you will concern yourself with discovering who you are in God. That's really true. So let's talk about this principle of the kingdom to get a foundation here for words. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 28 is a wonderful scripture uh, reading. Jesus said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a person should cast seed into the ground. Now that means just what it says. The kingdom of God is works just exactly like a farmer works his field. He says, this, after this person cast the seed in the ground, he should sleep and rise night and day. Now look here. And the seed should spring and grow up. Now, that's what nobody can do. Uh, a seed is a miracle. I'm sure you've done it. I think everybody's done it. Hold a seed in your hand, look at it, and say, I've got a handful of miracles. You ever hold wheat? See, I, I was born and raised up on a farm. All I know is, is to be a farmer. I'm still a farmer. I'm just farming with this kind of seed. God's Word says the same thing. And every one of those seeds is a miracle. Uh, scientists could, could fabricate one out of artificial materials, or they could do their best to match the materials and scientifically analyze the materials and fabricate their seed out of the same materials and make it so identical that you could put them under a microscope and not tell the difference. But put them both in the ground, one would rot and one would grow. See, so God's, uh, this principle of the kingdom is, ter is a terrific principle. This guy, this person or lady, after you cast seed into the ground, you should sleep and rise day and night and the seed should spring and grow up. You know not how, Jesus said. You can't figure that one out. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Now what's he saying? Don't get carried away with the theological sound of it. It's real simple. The kingdom of God, which is God in us, God in us relating to everything around us, see. God in us being God at work on this earth. See, we are, I almost say we are God's, I don't want to say that, but we, we are in God's image. God lives in us. Our life is His life. We are Him. We're, we're, the, we're, we're the expression of His person on earth. Uh, we furnish the flesh and the blood. He furnishes the life. And that combo puts God in the flesh, or we call it a Christian. Now, I like to think of a Christian like that. I don't like to think of a Christian as somebody that goes and joins a church. That don't cut any... Uh, ice with me, uh, but I think of, of, of the kingdom of God, God in me at work among people. I know if the Bible means anything, it means that God and me are hooked up together and we was able to get together because he fixed it that way from the beginning, but then Adam and Eve messed it up and sinned and, 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 and spoiled the plan so that the, a barrier was raised between God and the creations that he had made just like him. So they were ostracized from his presence, driven out from the garden, and there they were to be alone. And this sin was contagious. It had infected the whole human race, so down to our time, it's the same. But God didn't like it, so he fixed it. He gave his son Jesus to pay for our problems and, 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 and sustain the whole penalty that you and I ought to have sustained. Why? Because if our penalty is paid, then we don't have to pay it. If our debt's paid, we don't have to pay it. If our judgment is, is, is already uh, measured out, then you can't measure the same judgment for the same crime twice. If it's measured out once, it's finished. So Jesus did that, God's Son, on our behalf, in order that he could absolve us 
from all wrong and we would be justified, just as if I had never done it. And, and another word we use for that is we could be redeemed, bought back, or another word we say we could be restored. We're restored to God. So the bottom line of salvation, of, of, of what Jesus did on the cross for us, to restore his kingdom at work in people like God planned it from the beginning, the bottom line is he paid us out of debt. Net, clean, pure, perfect, total, 100%. For one reason, so that, he, so that we could be restored to God like we were before we ever sinned and just as if we had never sinned, clean and pure before God, clean and pure before God. Why? So that God could come home and so that you and me could come home. And by coming back together, the package is restored. And there is God's kingdom in us. You know, kingdom sounds real holy, sounds like a kind of a religious a holy word, and people get hung up on it. But that's what it's talking about. God back in us, where he could work freely and be manifested among other people, and uh, we could show him God. Now, when that happens, the principle of this kingdom is that it works just as simple as a farmer planting, planting seed in the ground. We all know how he does that. You say you want some wheat. Well, you don't go get kaffir corn. You, you get wheat. And you sow wheat and you get wheat. You want some cotton. You don't plant uh, tomatoes. You, you, you go get, you plant cotton. Now, that's the way the kingdom works. So, it, it all, I've said all that to impress upon you that the kingdom of God at work in you works through seed. That brings up a question. What is the seed? Here it is, Luke 8, 11. The seed is the word of God. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Where do you plant it? Matthew 13, 38 tells you where to plant it. The field is the world. World, look that up. The people in the world. People. People. The world is people. The seed is the word of God. The field is people, including me, including you. Mark 4, 14 says, The sower soweth the word. I am the sower. I am the gardener. I have a garden. Emerson said that. I have a garden. I'm in control of my garden. You're in control of yours. Your garden soil is you. Your spirit, your person, your uh, you. You have a garden. You are the tiller of your garden. You can produce of your garden what you want to produce of your garden. What do you want to grow, radishes or cabbage? Take your choice. You can have either one. The soil will grow either one of them. You say, well, I just don't want to grow anything. I'm tired. I'm fed up. Okay, your garden's going to grow anyway. But it's going to grow weeds, cockleburs, sandburrs and what have you. I don't want my garden to grow weeds. I spent my life as a boy chopping cuckleburs and sandburrs and crab grass and all this other junk out of, the, out of the gardens. I know what that stuff is. You let that stuff get to grow and it'll root in and boy, it's tough. You gotta, it'll bring you to your knees grubbing it out. And that's what the wrong thing in your life will do, bring you to your knees grubbing and cowering. Plant nice stuff. Plant stuff that's beautiful. Plant some flowers along the way. <laughs> uh, plant a beautiful crop. Make your garden beautiful. And make it productive. Make it grow with good things. 
Luke 17, verse 21 says that, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, let's hook all this up with, with Galatians uh, 6 and 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Don't kid. Don't try to kid around about it. Whatsoever a person sows, that you're going to reap. Well, we know that. <clears throat> so, this is what we're going to plant. The Word of God. The promises of God. Hebrews 11 and 3 says, Through faith, we understand. I mean, I'm reading this to say, what, what do we think of this? What, what kind of stuff is this? It, it, does this really have the stuff in it? Has this got God's stuff in it? The Word. Okay. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Can you beat that? The worlds were framed. How'd God create the world? With words. Boy, I hope you get this today. Chapter 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The, the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved. That's, that's something you can't understand. Makes that seed grow. There's life in it. Spirit in it. Sounds funny to say there's a spirit in that seed, but that's what it amounts to. Some guy, one of these uh, pharaohs that was buried, I think it was, I read about it not long ago, uh, two or three thousand years in one of the pyramids, and they had, they had uh, uh, removed this uh, mummy from, from this tomb, of course, in dry, arid Egypt and on the desert there, and they had, they had buried with him some wheat seed, uh, two or three thousand years. And they took that out, and they took some of it and planted it. And it grew. Beautiful. See, life in the seed. This is the old, old book. But you bring it out and plant it, it'll grow. There's life in it. There's a there's spirit in it. What kind of power, what kind of spirit or life is in it? See, it said, darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said... Wow. Let there be light. What in the world did he say light for? Light. I like to think about that. There was nothing but darkness, but God said, let's have light. And here it came. We do that all the time when we have faith in God's Word. Here's nothing but sickness, but we say be healthy. We speak light where there was darkness. We speak health where there was sickness. We speak freedom where there are demons. We speak happiness where there's grief. The power of God's Word does it. Do you believe that? We say to a storm, quiet down. And it quiets down. You can do it. He created the worlds. Now, think about this. God created the worlds. God created, God created, God created. We get acquainted with God in, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 1 again and again. How he created. He sp and, and he did it by speaking again and again. And he said, and he said, let there be. And he said, let there be. And then he made us. And he made us in his image. That tells me, at the bottom line, you and I are creators. And that brings up this beautiful idea, I think. I love to think about it. We being the only creatures on this earth who can 
pronounce words are the only ones. See, a word is an energizer. See, the psychologists are learning it today, and they're making hay with the idea. I wish Christians would learn it, because the psychologists, all they're learning is the natural energizing power of words. But they've learned. I said to my wife, Daisy, sometimes I hear these announcements on TV, and I say, that makes me so mad. Everybody knows the power of words but the church. Christians go out and give their message and, and fill it with a bunch of mean words, and they don't realize that every mean word you say energizes meanness in people. You ever see a preacher that has fusses all the time in his church? People, uh, you know, there's some churches just fussing and fighting all the time. You listen to them preach, that, that preacher's sermons. He's using those mean words, and those mean words will energize anger and vindicativeness and hatefulness and meanness. Anything you say with your lips, the psychologists are learning that much. You will energize that in people. There's a transmitting power in the, in the miracle of a word that will make other people do what you tell them to do. What you, words you say in their presence, they will do those words. Try it sometimes in a hot argument and change the tone of your voice and use nice words and see what happens to who you thought was your enemy. He or she will calm down and the fuss will be over. You did it. That's the natural power. And, and, and I wish the church would teach more of that. Preachers, teach more of that. Bible school uh, uh, students, teach more of that. Learn the power of words. You want me to say something here that you might censor me for? You might get mad at me for? You might mark me off as a, as a humanist? I hope you wouldn't. If anybody knows the difference, I do. But I'd like to say this. If you won't take it from the Bible, at least get Emerson's writings and take it from him. Wouldn't that be awful for Christians to learn more from Emerson's writings than to do from the Bible? Where do you think Emerson got it? That's where it come from. I get, uh, it upsets me sometimes when they say, oh, you sound like one of them positive thinkers. I say, no, sir, they sound like us. We had this stuff first. We know the source where it come from. Them guys out copying, but they don't know God. I don't want to say they all don't, a lot of them do, no doubt a lot of them do, wonderful people. But, uh, but what I, my, my point is, here is the source of it. Now, all of this seed is available to you and me. And we are creators like God. And my friends, we can go out and create people just exactly like we and God want them to be. That's nice and beautiful and colorful and lovely and, and not hateful and not vindicative and not mean and not cruel and jealous. We can just talk it out of them. We can just seed it out of them and seed them for beauty. You can do it. All you got to do is learn how to talk. But look, if the psychologists have learned that, may God help us to wake up. We ought to be the greatest psychologists in the world. Jesus was. Don't you believe that? To simply motivating the thinking of people so that they will be energized to be beautiful instead of ugly, good instead of bad. Now, that's what the power of God's Word is meant to do in our lives. People look at Daisy and I. We're sweethearts. We've been married 40... Oh, now I'm on the spot. I don't know it's 41 or 42 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're sweethearts today. That's not just an accident. It, that marriages don't come that way. You grow them that way. Daisy and I don't fuss. We won't fuss. We can disagree, but we never use words that energize reaction or hatred. We measure our words. We respect one another. We love one another. 
and we respect one another as a human creature in God's image. And so you wouldn't say a, a word to energize hatred or retaliation in another person. You wouldn't do that. Not if you want to motivate them to, to, to be good. And so a marriage uh, just gets more beautiful and more beautiful all the time, I can tell you. Words. We're made in his image. We're created like God. We're the only creature with power to talk. Words rule our world. Words constitute our nation. We talk about America. America is a bunch of words on a piece of paper. That's what America is. America is you. But the entity as a nation is a bunch of words on a piece of paper called the Constitution. Our courts are governed by words. It's words. The big idea in today's lesson is that we are like God and we can create with words. We call it confession. The positive side of confession. I like what Charles Capp said. I noticed in his new book. It's a beautiful and a wonderful book. Uh, he said there, the, the Lord spoke this through him one time in some meeting, I think somewhere in Texas. He said, and I clipped it and put it here. I, I wanted to read it to you. There's not one bit of the power, there's not one bit of the power departed from my word. There is as much power in my word now as there was the day I spoke it. My word is not void of power, but my people are void of speech. They will not speak what I have said, but they speak what the world says. They speak what the enemy says. God also said this, and I'll never forget it. Charles Capp says this. Even as there is creative power in my word to be released when you speak it, there is also evil power present in the words of the enemy to afflict and oppress everyone who speaks them. Now, see, I say that a little different. You can energize people for meanness or for, to be argumentative, to be nasty, to be reactionary, or you can energize them to be cooperative and lovely and compatible and, and, uh, and uh, lovely. I like it that way better. I want to share with you something. I've been in Africa. We were invited by the president of Mobutu. Uh, he's been in power 19 years and is president of the largest nation in Africa. And uh, because we've scattered millions of our, of our books and tracts all over his nation, uh, that was brought to his attention by by our friend Reverend Jaye in France who was down there visiting and Mr. Mobutu uh, sent first class tickets to Daisy and I to come and spend two weeks during the Christmas season with him and his family which was a very very great honor. While we were there the ambassador Mr. Ngam Mbanda uh, who is uh, the ambassador over all of the Western ambassadors He's a very, very great person and is a born-again, Holy Spirit-filled, beautiful, positive Christian. Uh, so much so that he is a, a teacher of the gospel. And uh, he's just one of the most terrific and wholesome persons I've ever met. Well, of course, we had many hours of wonderful fellowship because this top ambassador of the nation of Zaire was with us day after day throughout almost almost three weeks altogether that we were in Zaire uh, with the president. And Mr. Ngamba and Daisy and I had many, many wonderful talks. And he's so excited because he's a new born-again believer. Uh, through Reverend Jaye, he got our books, and through our books he found Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of healing, and I tell you, he is a hundred percent believer. And isn't that terrific? And so, uh, so we were talking a lot about the power of the Word. We have the Word in us. Boy, the devil better back off, and so forth. And he said, Brother Osborne, 
I'm going to tell you something here that's going to turn you on. He said, I wish everybody... He said, when you come and talk to us that way, to we of the Bantu tribe, he says, I am a Bantu. He says, when preachers come over and talk to us about God's Word being powerful, that isn't anything new to us, we Bantu people. He said, in the Bantu custom, our words are energized by power of the spirits of the gods to make our words good. Now that's what he told me as an African, speaking of the culture. Of course, he's been converted out of that now and is a, is a, is a beautiful, believing Christian. And that's why Christianity and the power of the word in him is so vital and living because he come out of this tribal custom. Where do you think those tribes got that custom? Way back generations before that was handed down from the old, from the people of faith who engendered that in generations and generations. And it comes out down into the Bantu people down across Africa. He said, we Bantus, when we say anything, we, we, uh, nous déclenchons la puissance pour accomplir ce que nous disons. That's in French. He says, we release the power with our words to produce what we say. Isn't that terrific? That's what a Bantu believes. He said, for example, if we curse someone, if we have an argument with someone, if we pronounce bad on someone, he says we believe that particularly between 3 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the morning, all of the spirits of the gods are out at work. And what they're doing, they're out there carrying out our words. They have the power. Our words release those spirits to do that. And if we pronounce a curse on someone, our word is out there working every day, every day, every day, until we withdraw that word, those spirits keep working with that word until they accomplish what we said. So he said, if we want to solve an argument or we want to heal a wound between our friends or a husband and wife or, or neighbors or anybody, he says, we have a formal meeting and we get together and we have some sacrifice. He didn't go into all the details and go through a ceremony, a religion. What's the difference? Another religion. And he said, we, then we, at a, in a formal way, we stand before them and we strike hands with them and we say, I do now withdraw my words from being accomplished anymore. And I forbid that the words that I pronounced over you can have any more effect upon you. Then he says those spirits can't do anything else. Now isn't that a lesson? I thought, oh God. That, that's all I'm trying to get across to Christians. That's what the Holy Spirit is. That's what God in His Word. And those words can come into us. And we put them in our heart. And out of the buns of our heart, we speak. That's confession. And we say what God says in His Word. And when we say it, our pronouncing of the... Here I am preaching again. Did it teach him? Boy, don't I get worked up. I love this stuff. We release God. We turn the Holy Spirit loose and our words become energized with God to make them good. Oh boy. That's deep, folks. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Isn't that what I was talking about? Pretty simple, isn't it? Joshua 1 and 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Wow! You bet! 
The principle of the kingdom, it's like a man going out and sowing seeds. Sleeps and rise. It springs and brings forth and buds and brings forth fruit. He doesn't know how. But he, put, he chose the seed. You choose the seed in your life. You can be mean or you can be nice. You can be ugly or you can be beautiful. And you can energize everybody that hears you Say, can I put this, I must put this on this lesson. I must say this to you. I've just edited the book Soul Winning. It, it's, it's the classic on soul winning literature. We sent out over 100,000 copies free when we first published it, probably 20 or 25 years ago, to, to preachers and missionaries and leaders all over the world. And it is the seed package out of which has, has, has grown this worldwide revival of soul winning today all over the world. Soul winning, out where the people are. I used to say out where the sinners are, now I say out where the people are. Sinner is a judgmental word. People are people. You know, that's an example. So, now I've just edited it, and I would like to encourage you to get a copy of the new edition. You can get it from Harrison House at Tulsa, Oklahoma, who's our publisher of that book. So, uh, so, so get a copy of the new one, and then find somebody that's got a copy of the old one, one of the old ones, any one of the old ones. We've published it for many, many years, many editions, any one of the older ones. Uh, but then get it, get the new one, and then go through the book and make it a study to you. Preachers especially, I urge you, and anybody, go through it and analyze and compare each chapter. The message is unchanged, every idea is exactly the same, but we simply turned it around and instead of energizing reaction, we energized participation. Instead of making it an obligation, we turned it into a privilege. It's just the difference in words. See, I'm growing all the time. I don't know it all. But boy, I'm reaching for the stars. And I know this, I want to help people be good. I don't want to make people mean. If you preach mean, you'll make mean people. That's not just preaching. We think of this in the pulpit. This is on your job, working with your, with, with your fellow workers. This is working with your partners. This is at the mechanic shop. This is in the factory. This is in the office. You can energize the most beautiful offices. If you don't believe it, follow my daisy around in our office. Walk in our office. If anything we've been complicated, uh, complimented for is for, for the beauty and, and the atmosphere of our office. People feel at home. It's lovely there. Go visit us sometime at Tulsa. Uh, uh, but, but follow Daisy around and practice her, what she practices. She energizes beautiful people. And that's what I did to the soul winning book. I made up my mind, I must, I, must, I must take the bite out of that book. You know, I'm getting a little older, so I'm learning a little bit more. Another 10 years, I'll be smarter yet. <laughs> I want to keep on growing. I want to help people. But, but you see, we come on and we get these truths and bless God we set out then to convince the world. And man, we don't do anything but just, just, just create a fight, a war everywhere we go. That's what makes denominations, all these different denominations. But we can go out and be Jesus. People love everybody, recognize God in everybody. You know what I mean, the potential of God in everybody. And, and see that people are made like God. That's the idea. And, and then energize them with the love message of Jesus. We just produced a new combo album, book plus the recording. I've recorded And the title of it is The Big Love Plan. And it's so beautiful. I decided one day, I've, I've got to think about, I've written for years, The Seven Steps to Be Saved. I've written them, published them. You can find them in our writings all across the country. But one day I got to look at them, and I got to look at all of the mean words I had put in that. And I thought, couldn't that be said where it wouldn't make them say, oh, are you talking to me? Make them think, oh, you're talking to me. It's easy to do. It's just the choice of words. It's whether you grow wheat or cockleburs. just depends what you put in the ground. 
That's the principle of the kingdom. That's why I say don't squawk loud, but talk proud. We got a lot of squawkers and hawkers. I'd rather have talkers of peace and of beauty. You believe it? Get that book. It's a real good idea for you. I'd love to see you do that and, 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 and compare it and say, why did he take that word out and change that to this word? Ask. It's one of the greatest practical lessons I could give you. Well, I want to just say this. There's just two powers. That thief is out to kill us, but Jesus has come to give us life. I'm on Jesus' side. I'm not running with the thief. So I don't want to energize meanness. Colossians 2, uh, 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Colossians 2.15 Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. I love that. According to these scriptures, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, spoiled the power of the devil, triumphed over the devil. Since Satan's works have been destroyed, his power has been spoiled, he has been triumphed over, he must be a defeated foe, and I know it. And I'm a winner because Jesus lives in me. Jesus triumphed was my triumph. I pray as David did in Psalms 1914, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Paul quoted David in 2 Corinthians 4.13. He, uh, he made a beautiful statement. Uh, David said in the 116th Psalm, I love the Lord. Verse 9, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 10, I believed, therefore have I spoken. In other words, if God said it in his word, you can say it in your word. Don't squawk loud. Talk proud. Say what God says. Stand up and be an ambassador of the king. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Isn't that terrific? God said it. I can say it. Example. Psalms 25, 27. 35, 27. Because he has said, the Lord hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Psalms 102, verses 1 and 3. Because he said, the wealth and riches shall be in your house. We may boldly say, Yes, Lord, you take pleasure in blessing me with plenty. You are the source of all wealth and riches, and you do will them for my house. You believe that? Because he said, we can say. Because he has said, Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. You may boldly say, Yes, Lord, you are the Lord who heals me. Confession. Paul said, consider the high priest, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Our confession is expressing our thoughts. When our thoughts derive from God's word, let the thoughts of our heart and the meditation and the words of our lips be acceptable in that. They're acceptable when they come from his word. 
And Paul said to here, he hath said, so we may boldly say. So go through your Bible and outline what God hath said and say, yes, I can say that. I will say that and not what's been contradicting that because he is the high priest of my confession. He is the spirit energizer of what I say. He sits and intercedes on behalf of my confession that comes out of my heart. So he said it, I'll say it. He said it, he'll make it good because when I say it with faith, it is energized by a miracle And that power is with me all the time. So when I stand by the bedside of someone sick, I can speak to them. And God's Holy Ghost will energize His Word and that seed will grow. And I'm a kingdom person. I said what God said. Don't squawk loud. Talk proud. Be the ambassador of God's kingdom. He said it. You say it. Practice it. Believe it. Live it. Speak it. Energize it. And you will see it come to pass. And your farm will be beautiful. God bless you.